Welcome Concordia Theological Seminary and our lectionary podcast for the uh, second Sunday after Pentecost. Our text that we'll be looking at is Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, all the way through 10, verse 8. So this is, uh, this is our text for the second Sunday after Pentecost. The, um, the text begins here with the description of Jesus' ministry. And then it shows us an expansion of that ministry as he calls the 12 apostles and sends them out into the harvest field. The text uh, intertwines two themes in relationship to this, uh, in this mission work. We have the harvest field and the um, workers or laborers. And then on the other hand, you also have, or maybe in addition, you have the lost sheep of Israel who need a shepherd. You have two different uh, kind of uh, themes working together here and in in coming back and forth. We'll take a look at that as we go along. Now last Sunday was Trinity Sunday, and the text from Matthew 28 focused on going out into all the world, to all the people, all the Gentiles, all nations, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But today's text specifically sends, Jesus specifically sends the newly appointed apostles to the lost sheep of Israel. In fact, tell them don't go anywhere but to the lost sheep of Israel. This now, you see these two together, I don't want you to think of that as a contradiction because it certainly isn't a contradiction. It's more of a matter of timing. Matthew 28 takes place after the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And here we have our text for today taking, or for Sunday, taking place nearer the beginning of Jesus' ministry, uh, his earthly ministry, where he is first sent to the lost people of Israel. And then from there, after his resurrection, into all the world. Dr. David Scare would label, does label uh, chapter 9, verse 35, the beginning of the pericope here, as uh, the beginning of the second discourse uh, in Matthew. But Dr. Jeff Gibbs, uh, he considers verse 35 as a concluding or uh, the back end of a bracket with the identical verse, and indeed identical, Matthew 4, verse 23. Now my personal opinion is that verse 35 provides, maybe serves better, as a title verse of a new section of the gospel. Uh, that seems to be, uh, if I were going to go into a long, lengthy discussion, I would probably want to connect it, uh, Matthew's understanding of uh, Genesis, for instance, and the use of these titles along the way. But we won't go into all of that. It probably won't help your preaching anyway. So, let's take a closer look at the verses themselves. So we have verse uh, nine, chapter 9, verse 35. We start out with the Daskon. I think, here we go. The Daskon. And then we have the Synagogues and the Kerusone. Yep. So we have these, um, these three uh, participles just exactly the same as they are in chapter 4, verse 23 of Matthew. And what they do is they're expressing the purpose. You can think of them as, as um, yeah, their, their quality of purpose here. They express the purpose of Jesus' ministry, the um, teaching, the preaching, or the, uh, whoop, I missed it. Where'd I go? I don't I'm sorry, this is the wrong word. Don't pay any attention to that. It's this one here. We have the preach or the uh, teaching, we have the proclaiming or the um, teach or uh, preaching, and then we have the healing over here. So these three participles kind of set out the purpose of what Jesus' ministry is about, what he's doing here in his earthly his ministry, his journey that he's on. Going in verse 36 then, we have an aorist passive form, the, um, 
at Estaloxase. I really cannot pronounce that worth a darn. Uh, and it's, uh, it's the uh, pass error of passive form to, um, to have pity, to, um, to be filled with compassion, tenderness, uh, a very uh, visceral gut kind of, of word. Uh, and it almost always, almost always has Jesus or the Father as, as, the, uh, as the subject here. Seldom people. Then we have this uh, very interesting word also here. If I can find it up there. Hmm. It's in there somewhere. This the ver or the word is um skulo or skulo, meaning to, to um to flay or to skin. Yeah, literally to skin, and, and it, um, it's used here in the sense to, uh, to distress, to harass, to uh, worry, maybe to trouble. I, I think it's important. Now, this is a common theme throughout the Old Testament, but I think it's uh, best connected, in my opinion anyway, to Ezekiel 34, where we have this uh, passage, which is a prophecy... Um, against the false and the wicked shepherds. Fairly familiar pericope. Uh, the ones who harass rather than help uh, or minister to the needs of the sheep. So definitely we've got uh, uh, that connection going on. Here's that word. I knew it was in there somewhere. Uh, but this idea of, of uh, harassing rather than helping rather than ministering to the sheep. That's what the, that's what the uh, mark of the false and wicked shepherds of Ezekiel are, and certainly you get that same context, the same idea here, and we'll, we'll come back and forth to that, I believe, as we go along. Uh, then we have this uh, interesting verb here, the, the epimenoi. The epimenoi, or the eremenoi, excuse me, uh, the perfect passive participle in this case from uh, ripto, which means to cast down or to prostrate, either, either from drunkenness or from receiving a, um, the reception of a mortal wound. And so we see the people here now described as sheep. And they're being mishandled. Are they lying helpless here, victims of no shepherd, or at the very least, they are uh, suffering the consequences of having false and bad shepherds? Uh, no good shepherd, at least, that's for certain. However, this could also, I guess, be taken in a more general sense. I think Dr. Gibbs does this a little bit, that the people are maybe being victims of just evil spiritual forces over which they have no control. Uh, but still, I think uh, there's an indication here of some worthless, even evil spiritual shepherds or leaders. In Ezekiel 34, of course, as you know, this problem is remedied with the uh, advent of the good shepherd. Uh, Micah also, Micah 5.1, you see it there. It's, it's throughout the prophets, very common. Okay, moving on to verse 37. Uh, Jesus now switches, or at least he adds another metaphor to the mix here and describes the people as the harvest, the uh, perismo. There we go. Paris, or therismo, excuse me. The therismo. The therismo, the harvest, um, should probably be thought of uh, uh, as the crop. Uh, that is to be harvested, that kind of idea. Um, I think even Gibbs makes that point there in his Matthew commentary, uh, a crop to be harvested. And uh, this certainly there is the idea then that it's harvest time, which also brings a great sense of urgency 
Uh, there's a time sensitivity here, a sense of urgency, which may very well provide a sermon illustration for you here. But once the crop is ready to be harvested, any delay results in a loss of grain. Not having enough workers or laborers, these, uh, the ergotai here, if we don't have enough workers or laborers for the field, then of course that's going to bring about a delay and a loss of yield. Now elsewhere in Matthew, this uh, therismos is used as uh, an eschatological term uh, for the harvest at the judgment time. And that, for instance, uh, chapter 13, 39 to 40, uh, we see Matthew using it that way. In verse 38, then, we have the uh, the eitheta. The eitheta is um, an aorist imperative form from a doimai, the idea to ask or to beg. Uh, and in this context, I think it's, um, it's safe to translate it then as pray earnestly you know, with an intensity. Um, and then we have the ekbale, to cast out or to um, send out, in this case probably better, uh, the begging or the praying earnestly then here to the Lord of the harvest, as it says, reminds us, and I think this is a pretty important point, reminds us that the ministry is always that of the Lord's. And the disciples or the apostles or our ministry is an extension then of Jesus' ministry. Uh, to quote Dr. Gibbs, whenever missionaries are sent, whenever missionaries sent by Jesus conduct their ministry, that ministry is empowered by Jesus, shaped like Jesus' own ministry and centered in the message about the reign of heaven in Jesus himself. So this is a, yeah, this is a, a important point to remember that Jesus isn't telling people to go out and start their own ministries. And we get that language sometimes, but we're actually all of the ministry is an extension. It's just his ministry being carried out through us. All right, so going on here then to verse, um, chap we'll go on to the next chapter here, chapter 10, verse 1. And uh, this uh, proskalesoamenos, and I know I butchered that, but it means to um, call to oneself, that reflexive nature there, the call to oneself uh, from proskaleo. The, um, and then we have the didomai uh, form again, the didoka, dodeka rather, the uh, to give. And here is, uh, here's this next section here. Is, is again a very important one. We had this last week as well. The axion oimaton akatharton. The idea of, um, in this case, the, the um, authority, the authority again that is God's and Jesus and given to than to us the authority over unclean or um, yeah, unclean spirits, that idea. So the Father, as we said last week, the Father gives authority to the Son, to Jesus, and now Jesus gives his authority to the, um, to the 12 disciples and apostles here. That's what's coming up anyway. Uh, it's a common pattern. You see it again, like we said last week in Matthew 28. But this, this idea, you know, the all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, or as you are going, make disciples. Uh, so this is a, a pattern to keep your eyes on. But the idea, who has the authority? And that's always a question. He taught them as one who had authority. Where does that come from? It can only come from God. 
what does he do with it? He uses it, but he also then gives it to be used. So um, then we have uh, this uh, to heal every disease and affliction. Now using that language, it takes us right back then, in support of this, right back to, chap or to verse uh, 35, 935 that we did just a minute ago. And again, this idea of the apostles' ministry simply is an extension of the ministry of Jesus. So also the office of the public ministry, simply an extension of Jesus' ministry, and any and all ministry of the church is an extension of Jesus' ministry. It reflects it, not just because it's like it, but because it is it. Absolutely. All right, verse 2. Verse 2, we have apostolone. All right here. This is, the, uh, this is the only use of the word apostle in Matthew. The only time in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew that he uses this word. So what happens here is we see in verse 37, previously, Jesus is addressing his disciples as a larger group, <coughs> excuse me, and then calls out from their midst the 12 specific disciples or apostles or disciples to be apostles, and then he sends them out. Uh, and this word, uh, where's it at? Uh, hmm. Ah, uh, yes, uh, the protos, first. As they start to list these apostles, the first that's listed then is Simon, also Peter. Uh, this first isn't just an issue of order, but it's, it's like first among equals, I think it was described as in one place. Uh, the idea that Peter won't necessarily be greater than the others, but he will be the spokesperson or the um, uh, a leader in, in, in one sense, not as that he's greater, but that he has been, this is why, and this first, this protos, and then him being labeled first is kind of pointing to that. Um, another uh, interesting thing here in this uh, list of the 12, of the 12 here, and verses, uh, we'll continue on, 3 and 4, uh, is this, uh, and most of these you can just figure out what they are. But this is kind of a strange one here. Uh, what's often translated as Simon the Canaanian. But this, uh, this verb, or this verse, verb, this word here is actually... Uh, well, I think most likely anyway, is most likely from the, uh, the, Aramaic, the Aramaic word, and they've just transliterated it. The Aramaic word here is um, kana'an. Uh, let's see if I can find a spot here to write it. I'll write it over here maybe. Kana'an is um, the Ara Aramaic ver or word for, um, for zealot. So really, you know, and we see this uh, supported then in some other lists then that we see with, uh, oh, in Luke 6 and Acts 1, uh, using the word uh, in, where, they, where they actually use the, the Greek word for zealot, uh, zelotes for Simon. So it's really Simon the Zealot. Uh, it shouldn't be considered a, uh, a, a contradictory name in the list or anything like that. It's just an Aramaic transliteration is what they're doing here. Um, verse 5 then. Let's scroll on up there. Uh, Dr. Gibbs considers <coughs> excuse me, chapter 10, verse 5, as the beginning then of Jesus' second major discourse. Uh, Dr. Scare sees the beginning at 9.35, as we said, and Gibbs then considers 9.36 through 10.4, which you just covered, as two introductory sections to the second major discourse. 
Now, as we look here then, uh, specifically at verse 5 then, the apestelen, apestelen, this is um, the aorist active participle form of apostello, meaning to send forth or, or to send out. Um, and then uh, we have along with that the per angelas, uh, meaning to uh, another aorist participle here from parangelo to, uh, to instruct, to give orders, if you will. Uh, and as mentioned previously, the order here, you know, really is don't go to Samaritan, don't go to Gentiles, don't go to other nations, but specifically the order is go to the Jews. The 12 here are sent to the Jews specifically, not the ethnos, not the, not the Gentiles, not or the nations. Or, or uh, literally, if you will, when you look at this, um, in the way of the Gentiles. It's really how it, uh, in the way of the Gentiles. Don't go there. Um, and then as we go on here in, um, yeah, right here, the me apal, apale, apal theta. This is um, an error subjunction. Do not depart. Interesting, uh, as you go through here now, chapter 10, this is the first one, but you're going to find 27. 27 um, imperatives in this chapter. And this is the first of them. And so, you know, it's a very, there's a lot of commanding going on here about what to do, not to do, etc. Uh, looking at verses 6 and 8, 6 through 8, rather, together first, um, you see these verses laying out the mandate, if you will, uh, the mission. Uh, which Jesus is giving to his apostles now, the authority, remember the authority to carry it out, you know, go, preach, heal, raise, cleanse, cast out. Um, in this, uh, and this first, uh, da, 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 uh, Dr. Gibbs takes this, um, the, um, the lost sheep, And the house of Israel is being in an exegetical position. So he would translate it, and I think there's something to be said for this. Go to the lost sheep that is or that are the house of Israel. So once again, um, the idea of the imagery of shepherd and sheep here, uh, or rather the imagery literally of a sheep without a shepherd, as we saw there in chapter 9. Now, Jesus is now, again, tying the apostles' uh, ministry to reflect accurately that it's actually his ministry again to the sheep that he has identified. So as we look then at verse 7, we get the poroio menoi, uh, the idea of uh, as you are going, so as you're going, I think it's important here, it's a, it's a participle, but important here to notice now, having done this last week with Matthew 28, to notice the similarities between the two sendings. But it's also important to notice the differences because the Great Commission of 28 is not the same as this sending and there's some very specific differences. So there are similarities but some very specific differences here. Uh, I suppose uh, as we come to the close, one being an Old Testament guy, I have to tell you this, but one important issue to note in the closing is this distinction in verse 8 here of, uh, of lepers and what you do with lepers. The kartharidza uh, Notice that lepers are not put in the same category, those who are sick. 
this is an Old Testament reality that goes way back, uh, way back to uh, the Torah itself. But this, um, from Old Testament times, the distinction is held because leprosy separates one from the temple and thus from the presence of God. So that's why lepers are cleansed and not healed. Lepers are cleansed because you have to be cleansed to be reunited, to be allowed into the temple again. That's why lepers always have to show themselves to the high priest. They are cleansed, therefore reunited to the temple and to the presence of God. That's the distinction between diseases and leprosy. Uh, not all diseases will separate you from the house of God or from the face of God or the presence of God in the temple but leprosy does, absolutely. So this is kind of this um, uh, a uniqueness of leprosy, which, of course, we run into lepers all the way through Scripture and some very important uh, uh, dramatic accounts, you know, Naaman and then the, the, uh, the lepers who came to Jesus to be healed, and one was a Samaritan, you remember, interestingly enough, the ones he said, he said, go to the show yourself the high priest because they need to be proven they're cleansed. Well, they did except for the Samaritan who didn't go. And we always talk so highly of them. Well, that's fine, but you have to understand that Samaritans aren't allowed in the temple anyway. He couldn't show himself the high priest. Samaritans were considered unclean even if they didn't have leprosy. So he went to the new temple, Jesus. But I'm giving you too many things to think about. So... In closing, then, I just want to say, uh, may God bless your proclaiming of his gospel this coming Sunday.